Yeah, this this section would be accurately described as Cirrus discusses the children's card game. That that is that is one hundred and ten percent correct. So, let's talk about a lovely lovely children's card game called Yu-Gi-Oh. Now, I'm sure some of you have played Yu-Gi-Oh in the past. I'm sure some of you might even play Yu-Gi-Oh now. Uh, this is about a very specific format of Yu-Gi-Oh, though, that maybe some of you played one time without knowing about it, because, uh, of course, this is a time-locked format, or maybe some of you uh, just didn't even know this was a thing, and you started playing, you know, after 2010 or something. So, in any case, whatever category of Yu-Gi-Oh fan you happen to come into, allow me to introduce you to something called GOAT Format. Now, of course... It is called GOAT Format because one of the premier cards in the format was Scapegoat, and one of the premier strategies was called GOAT Control. Uh, however, uh, there is a bit of evolution that has happened in that format, and we will go over that here in a bit. But what is GOAT Format? Well, GOAT Format is the format of Yu-Gi-Oh! that was played in 2006 using the April 2006 ban list, and most importantly, it uses every card in the game up until the release of Cybernetic Revolution, and for most people, the tins that were released around that time, which is relevant because Exarian Universe was released around that time, and most people generally don't consider that part of the format anymore. If you didn't play Yu-Gi-Oh! during that time, then maybe that doesn't mean anything to you. Don't worry, it won't mean anything to you going forward either. But, why is GOAT format a thing? Well, as Yu-Gi-Oh! has gotten bigger and bigger and faster and faster, most games are completed relatively quickly. Uh, games are ran very fast, there's a lot of one-turn kill combos, and in general, players have become less players and more pilots. Uh, what I mean by that is if you're playing a game of modern Yu-Gi-Oh, it matters more that you've memorized the combos your deck does and l and that you memorize the exact point on your opponent's combo where they need to be interrupted, uh, as opposed to uh, legitimately dealing with stuff just card by card, on a card by card basis. There's always a linchpin that you need to defend and a linchpin that your opponent uh, needs to not be subverted for you to win. Modern Yu-Gi-Oh! is a very different monster than old-school Yu-Gi-Oh! The days of setting two cards face down and passing turn to your opponent have largely been gone. They are, they are just out of here. They are not a thing anymore. Uh, but in uh, Go format, you actually do have access to those previous ways of playing. Now, who plays GOAT format? Well, a lot of people. If you are wondering how to get a game in of GOAT format, um, Dueling Book is a wonderful resource uh, for finding random matches. If you want to participate in tournaments, uh, there's also the GOATformat.com and also the Format Library uh, Discords. These are both communities you can use for playing in GOAT format, though I would like to convince more people, if they have the ability to, to please try to get people at your locals playing GOAT format more. The reason I say this is... Historically, Konami as a company has not recognized player-made formats. They have tried to push their own uh, secondary formats, and for the most part, with the exception of, say, Speed Duel, most of them have failed and fallen down to lack due to lack of support. I would like to see GOAT format eventually get officially recognized by Konami. Uh, it would be it would be cool because that's a thing that Wizards of the Coast at least did with things like Commander format. For those who don't know, for Magic the Gathering, EDH uh, was a format that was player-invented. And then in, I believe, 2013, uh, Wizards officially adopted Commander Format as a format that they would support. I would like to see that going forward with Yu-Gi-Oh! with GOAT Format. A bunch of arguments for this have been that Konami wouldn't be able to make much money off of it. Uh, to that, I argue that even if they can't make money selling the product, they can make money by making reprint sets, and they can make money off GOAT format by hosting tournaments at venues uh, for it as well. And publicity for GOAT format also becomes publicity for their premier regular format. But a little bit about why you should play GOAT format. I've mentioned that I like it. I've mentioned that it's a slower format. Uh, but why should you play it? Well, largely because if you enjoy that more old-school, almost grindy kind of Yu-Gi-Oh, that back-and-forth, almost chess-like kind of Yu-Gi-Oh, uh, this is a format that allows you to go back 
and play that again. And not just play it the way you did as a kid where you didn't know what you were doing, but play it at a very competitive level. Because it turns out that there has been a lot of strategizing, and I mean a lot of strategizing, over what makes a good competitive deck for GOAT format. If you go over to formatlibrary.com, you can actually see the decks that have won various championships in online GOAT format tournaments. They have the deck lists here, much like with any other competitive format. So if you are the type of player who doesn't want to build your own deck and you want to figure out what the best thing you can play is at the, at the best, most optimum power, uh, you can do that by going to Format Library. Or if you're the type of player that's super unfamiliar with what makes a card good for GOAT format, this is a, this is a way you can find cards that are good for GOAT format. You'll notice that cards like Chaos Sorcerer, Black Luster Soldier, Blade Knight, Nobleman of Crossout, these are cards that frequently make it into GOAT format decks, and there's a reason for that. But before I get into any of that, We'll do a section over the cards that are most important for GOAT format. I will be missing a few of them, obviously, because there's a whole list of staples, but I'm going to go into some of the main ones. Um, if you are a competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! player, this is a wonderful format to get into because it is it is a very high skill ceiling. If you're a casual Yu-Gi-Oh! player, this is also a really good format to go into because of the other thing, it is very budget-friendly. You can build a fairly competitive deck in GOAT format for about $50 to $60. The only card in GOAT format that costs a significant amount of money is Delinquent Duo. That card's about $20 to $30. And that price, even with a single reprint that happened in the last 15 years, is probably not going to fluctuate all that much. But you only need one. If you can get a single Delinquent Duo, everything else for the deck's Every other card is under five bucks, under two dollars even for most of them. It's very easy to build a budget deck here. And if you'll notice from the various lists here, you can be fairly flexible with the builds that you run. This is a different format entirely here. Uh, but if we were to go here into the... Where is... Deck Gallery. As far as different decks you can choose to play... We have Goat Control, Chaos Control, a Recruiter Chaos build. There's a Dimension Fusion build, which is basically a one-turn kill build. A Reasoning Gate Turbo build, which is that same type of build but flipped around. Uh, there's Flip Control for those of you who enjoyed things like Dream Clown and Crass Clown. Warrior builds for different toolbox runs. Gear Freed, where you literally abuse the equipment mechanic of Gear Freed the Iron Knight. Drain Beatdown, utilizing Skill Drain. Things like Rescue Cat one-turn kill. Ben Kai one turn kill, Cyberstein one turn kill, all decks that despite being one turn kill decks are very easily interacted with and aren't anywhere near as fortified as what you would consider a premier one turn kill deck in a modern go. There's even decks like Pac-Man, which while I hate fighting against Pac-Man decks, literally just involves using tiny creatures to annoy your opponent until you can start beating them for tiny chip bits of damage. But this is literally a build that does nothing but annoy your opponent to death. These are the things you can do in GOAT. You're not just limited to the single GOAT control deck. And even on Format Library, you can see various different versions of these decks. So if there's if you don't like the version that hit a particular top eight, doesn't matter. You can play a different version of that deck. You can build your own version of that deck. Because one of the wonderful things about GOAT format is the types of cards that are in the format do not change. It will maintain the same list of cards now as it maintained in 2006. So once you get a decent stockpile of cards to play GOAT format with, you do not have to buy new cards as they release. You just pick up your first GOAT format deck, play around with it, and then maybe pick up pieces for other decks as you go bit by bit. You're only ever making this investment once, and unlike modern Yu-Gi-Oh!, the investment will always be under the $600, $500, even $100 mark. Now, let's say that you're the type of whale Yu-Gi-Oh! player that likes to have the most expensive deck possible. That's perfectly fine. You can build a $3,000 GOAT format deck. If you want a Sakuretsu armor that costs $70 instead of $0.50, cents, that is a thing that you have the ability to get. I am not that person, but I have met that person, and more power to that person. But... To the relevant cards in GOAT format, there's a couple things that need to be noted here. While the format is called GOAT format, and while Scapegoat is the premier card of the format, 
Goat Control, as most people knew it back then, is not the premier deck anymore because the amount of knowledge the player base has gained in the last 15 years about this particular format has increased over and over and over again. People have learned ways to deal with this deck, and what you'll find is that in GOAT formats meta, people find ways to knock out whatever the top deck is all the time. Because the cards don't change, a best deck never really gets established, because everybody knows the cards needed to counter whatever the best deck is. There will always be a way to subvert it. Goat Control was super strong, and then people found that Beast Down took out Goat Control really easy. Beast Down was super strong, and then people realized that various forms of uh, Chaos and Warrior Toolbox decks had the ability to manhandle those decks. And that circle would keep on going. Right now, I know that Warrior Toolbox decks are super popular, and that meta will be constantly shifting. Which means even though the same cards are prevalent in the format at all times... The format never really gets stale. There's always going to be something different, and there's multiple different decks you can try and play. There's always going to be something that you might not be expecting, even if you've been playing this format for years. The minute somebody drops a Morphing Jar number two on you in an Empty Jar deck is going to be the day that you go, oh shit, I wasn't expecting seeing that in today's tournament. But another card to be very aware of in GOAT format, not just Scapegoat, would be Metamorphosis. This is the reason Scapegoat was a premier card for so long. Scapegoat creates four zero attack, zero defense tokens that have one star. This is the original intention of this card was to create a wall between you and your opponent of monsters your opponent had to hit through. Players are a lot more ingenious than what Konami generally accepts, though. So despite these tokens being there mainly for defense, we found ways of abusing them using cards like Metamorphosis. Now, Metamorphosis sacrifices any card on your board, any monster on your board, to create a fusion monster, and it doesn't summon it via its correct summon conditions, that's important, but it creates a fusion monster, and that fusion monster uh, comes into play, and you can start using it right away. Normally, fusion monsters are bad in old school Yu-Gi-Oh! because the resources required to summon them are far too much. If I want to summon a Dark Blade, I need to have a Buster Blader in my hand, a Polymerization in my hand, and a Dark Magician in my hand, and that's three dead cards, and my opponent can just use Bottomless Trap Hole on the Dark Paladin when it comes out. So, not a really good investment, but... Playing a scapegoat, which gives me tokens I was using to defend myself with anyway, and that is dropping a metamorphosis on it, is great. Especially when I can make up all of the advantage that I lost by playing multiple cards, when the card I'm trying to summon is Thousand Eyes Restrict. This is our next incredibly important card for Goat. Thousand Eyes Restrict has the ability to basically suck up a card on the opponent's board and pull it over to your board as an equipment to him. Uh, he also paralyzes the entire board. Monsters can't change their battle positions, and monsters don't get to attack except for himself. So even if he takes a monster that is face down, meaning he'll gain no attack or defense when stealing it, it still basically removes the card from the board and you're still safe. Aside from playing a skill drain, your opponent doesn't really have the ability to interact with Thousand Eyes Restrict while he is face up. There are ways of interacting with him. There are cards like Tsukiyomi and Book of Moon that can turn him off and stun him long enough for you to kill him, but the fact that your opponent will have to dig for those cards means you can buy yourself a couple turns with this card very easily. And again, you're sacrificing a token that was essentially free to make him, and this is one of the most powerful cards in the format. Now, it's also important to note in regards to Metamorphosis that cards like Brain Control are actually viable in this format. Brain Control is allowed at 3. We can steal our opponent's boss monster, and then we can use Metamorphosis on it to create anything. The downside of Brain Control, aside from paying 800 life, is normally that we have to give the monster back to the opponent at the end of the turn. Except, we plan on sacrificing that card with Metamorphosis. My opponent plays a Blackluster Soldier to win the game, I play Brain Control, I steal it, I Metamorphosis it, and turn it into a fusion monster, he doesn't get his Black Luster Soldier back, and I got a free monster as a result of it. Very, very good card to note for the format, though not every deck needs to use it. Now onto the next very important thing for the GOAT format. We need to talk about the Holy Trinity. This is the Holy Trinity of cards in GOAT. Graceful Charity, Pot of Greed, and Delinquent Duo. Why are these cards called the Holy Trinity? These cards, unique to any other card in the format, are immediate plus ones. If I play Delinquent Duo, my opponent must discard two cards out of their hand. 
if I play Pot of Greed, I get to draw two cards for the cost of one. And if I play Graceful Charity, this should be a break-even card, because it draws me three cards and I discard two. I lost the Graceful Charity in the process as well, so I'm trading three cards for three. But there's another card that exists in the format, and that's Sinister Serpent. Relevant to this specifically, Sinister Serpent is incredibly relevant to the Trinity. Because Sinister Serpent, at each of our standby phases, comes back to our hand. If I play Graceful Charity and discard Sinister Serpent, the card comes right back. So it's a plus one just like Pot of Greed. On the flip side, if I hold a Sinister Serpent in my hand without playing it, or giving that knowledge to my opponent, if they play Delinquent Duo to make me discard two cards, Sinister Serpent gets to absorb one of those card discards, allowing me to only lose one card from the Delinquent Duo. While the Holy Trinity of Advantage in this format is important in and unto itself, the most important card to remember with it is Sinister Serpent. But let's talk about Graceful Charity for a second. There's one other reason this card is incredibly powerful, and that is the prevalence of Chaos Monsters in this format. Realistically, there's only two you're going to be playing, Chaos Sorcerer and Black Luster Soldier. Black Luster Soldier Envoy of the Beginning is the strongest card of the format, period. He can get rid of anything on the board, and he has the ability to attack twice if the opponent's open. In a scenario where my opponent has one monster on their board, let's say they have a flipped up Magician of Faith, and they tried to get a Pot of Greed back, and they have no trap cards, you can play Black Luster Soldier Envoy of the Beginning and attack over the Magician of Faith, doing 2700 damage, and then immediately attacking again for another 3000. For most people, that would probably be lethal damage in almost every scenario. Asgore Dreamer, thank you very much for the Tier 1 subscription. Um, that's lethal for most people by the time you get out of Black Luster Soldier. The other thing is he has the ability to, like Thousand Eyes Restrict, remove face-down cards. If my opponent has, say, a Maneater Bug face-down, despite the fact that's not really ran in the format, the Maneater Bug will never be able to flip up because Black Luster Soldier gets to get rid of it without flipping him up something that is unique to him, and Thousand Eyes Restrict, and of course, Nobleman of Crossout. But in creature form, almost completely unique to him and Thousand Eyes Restrict. There's other ways of getting rid of face-down monsters without uh, screwing yourself over, like Suzuki Samurai or Mystical Swordsman, but as far as removal effects, this is his area. But how do we summon Black Luster Soldier, and why did I mention him so close to Graceful Charity? Well, to summon this guy, you need MC Poto to redeem an Owl and Smiling Game Master to redeem an... Hada hada. No, 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 not really. They're monsters. They've forced me to do this in the middle of a gaming segment. Uh, but what you need is a light and a dark monster in the graveyard. Typically, this would involve trading your monsters with your opponent until you have enough in the graveyard to play. But if you have a Graceful Charity, you can just throw the light and dark monster in the graveyard completely free of charge. Just take them from their hand, chop them in the grave, remove them to summon Black Luster Soldier. But there's another side of Black Luster Soldier we've got to talk about. Is this the most powerful card in the format? Yes. Does this card close out games by the time he hops onto the board? Yes. But let's say you didn't close out the game. Let's say you played the Black Luster Soldier and he didn't kill the opponent immediately. Um, they have. There's many ways in which the opponent can defend themselves from a BLS. We're not going into them right now. I mentioned Brain Control earlier. In the event that your opponent plays Black Luster Soldier and does not kill you with it, Brain Control, or the card most people are going to have in their deck anyway, Snatch Steel, can take your Black Luster Soldier and start gaining all of that advantage for the opponent, because there is one thing Goat Format does not have a lot of, and that is protection from spells. Yes, there's access to cards like Magic Drain and Magic Jammer, but if you'll notice on most Goat Format lists, neither of those cards really show up. So when your Black Luster Soldier's out, best strategy is to win with it, or don't summon it, at all. If you find yourself in a scenario where you have to summon it and you're on the back foot and you don't win with it immediately, your opponent is probably going to kill you soon. Probably by either stealing it or summoning their own Black Luster Soldier, banishing yours, and therefore having the only BLS on the board. There's a couple more relevant cards to talk about, uh, and all of them can be summed in the words of Searchable by Sangan. Sangen is an incredibly important card for the format, like everything else I've talked about so far, because he searches monsters with 1,500 attack or less. Note, we talked about Sinister Serpent when talking about the Holy Trinity. Sangan can search up Sinister Serpent, and he's usually the first search you want to get. This means you have protection from Delinquent Duo, and really, 
you're going to be able to get the search off real easy. He's only got 1,000 attack. Your opponent will be able to kill him. Uh, there is one problem with Sangan, though, and that is that if he's banished, you will never be able to get his effect. Uh, I didn't pull up the card itself here, but there's a card in the format that's used a lot called Nobleman of Crossout. It banishes face-down monsters. In the event that you set a Sangan face down, normally that's the right play to do with a monster you want to just get sent away, the opponent is probably going to Nobleman of Crossout it immediately because it could be a Sangan, or it could be a Magician of Faith. Most of the time, it is best to play Sangan face up, because even though you will take a lot of extra damage by the Sangan getting hit, taking a thousand or even two thousand life points of damage is sometimes infinitely better than losing the ability to search up a Sinister Serpent, or a DD Warrior Lady, or, in the event of a Thousand Eyes Restrict coming on board, a Tsukiyomi. Most of these cards are going to be seen in every single deck, with the exception of Brain Control. Brain Control doesn't get seen in every one. Snatch Steel does, though. So everything I said about Brain Control still applies to Snatch Steel. And there are other cards we didn't talk about that I did mention, though. Cards like Tsukiyomi, cards like Nobleman of Crossout. There are also other cards in the format that, depending on the speed of that current format, get used. When GOAT format tends to slow down and favor more toolboxy decks, you tend to see cards like Premature Burial and Call of the Haunted played. But when GOAT format is faster and favors more aggro decks, like other variants of warrior decks, and also things like Beast Down, or even uh, even Beat Down Control, typically cards like Call of the Haunted and Premature Burial will be taken out of decks in favor of more copies of cards like Dust Tornado and Sakuretsu Armor. Sakuretsu being a mini mirror force, and Dust Tornado being one of the few cards in the format that can destroy back row cards. But, more than anything, more than anything, why should you play this format now that we've gone over bits and bits and bits about it? Well, honestly, it's fucking fun. If you enjoyed Yu-Gi-Oh! as a kid, and you enjoyed the idea of the way Yu-Gi-Oh! played in, say, the Battle City format, then this is a format that gets you back to that old style of Yu-Gi-Oh! where things are, yes, more slow, but also a lot more chess-like. Your individual plays matter. Mistakes you made on turn one will punish you on turn eight, and you'll get to turn eight. That's another important thing. You'll be able to get that far in it. Games might feel grindy, but they don't feel like a grind. It feels like, again, sitting down to a game of chess, trading blows and trading a war of attrition with your opponent going forward. But because there's so much mechanical complexity to the way that GOAT format plays, it feels like you're playing a high-level game of chess, not just trading your pawns with your opponent until you run out of pieces on the board. More than anything, though, this format is growing, and it's been growing over the last five, six, seven years, if not more. Typically at your local card shop, you'll find one or two people who play GOAT format, off and on. They might have a spare deck around. What I want to encourage is more people sitting down and learning GOAT format and teaching other people how to play GOAT format. If you have somebody who's only ever played modern Yu-Gi-Oh! and they've never played that more old school, getting down in the mud and wrestling with each other kind of Yu-Gi-Oh!, this is a wonderful avenue into that. If you've got somebody who misses the old school form of Yu-Gi-Oh, but still plays maybe even kind of begrudgingly, this is again a wonderful format to get them into. There are very few cons. The format doesn't rotate, so your investments don't go away. The format has a lot of players and it's constantly growing. You can play the format online if you don't have a local card shop around you. And the more people you get to play with it, GOAT format tournaments with multiple people with unique decks is one of the best experiences in the game that I've ever had, as somebody who's had the opportunity to run a handful of local GOAT format tournaments. For myself, my strategy to get more people playing GOAT in my area is going to be, be uh, to build a battle box, where I find a couple of deck lists that I can build for under $50 and build a box of about eight decks over time. I know that's a lot of money, I'm not able to drop that all at once, but I plan on building a battle box of these decks so I can run tournaments like this at my local game store. And if people want to continue participating in the format and get their own decks, then they are more than able to. Because again, the cost is super low. You can build a GOAT format deck for the same price that it costs you to buy a new video game for a console, or even a new video game on Steam. 
It's a super budget-friendly format, and I think a lot of people would enjoy it if they gave it a shot, if they haven't already. But that's enough yapping out of me. This is my favorite way of playing Yu-Gi-Oh! It is one of my favorite ways of playing card games, period. Despite the fact that my primary card game is Modern Magic the Gathering, this is my... Pr it, in a perfect world, this is my favorite way of playing. And I wish I could do it more. So take GOAT format to any particular local game store that you can. Make sure you've got articles on format library and stuff ready as they have full lists of every card legal for the format. And hopefully some of you found this informative if you didn't know about the format already. As always, everyone, if you want to support the channel, you can do that. I'll have relevant links in the description. But most importantly, insert end of video tagline here.